Across the masterful catalog of video games made by legendary developer From Software, there have been dozens upon dozens of character studies on the archetype known as the Warrior. Kingsfield, Armored Core, Otogi, but even more potently in their current golden age with Demon Souls, Dark Souls, Bloodborne, Sekiro, and most recently, Elden Ring. Across these titles, we have seen a wide, diverse range of warrior-type characters. You got the crestfallen and forgotten, the optimistic and doomed, the sinister and cunning, the noble and ill-equipped, with all of these sort of different forms or shapes repeating from game to game, rhyming in theme and execution, but always exploring the depths of the human spirit that has vowed to fight to the very last breath in one way or another. However, I would say that of this sort of FromSoft roster of warrior variants, I do indeed have a favorite, and I would refer to them as, well, the more lovable sort. Oftentimes, these dudes are a little rotund around the waist, not entirely capable like some of the greatest heroes of the land, but never lacking in heart or courage. A more kind, cheerful, and friendly sort of warrior that might need a little help along their way, but will always be there at your side as well during the steepest of challenges. And while there has been some iconic beloved characters like this, most notably the Onion Knights from the Dark Souls games, I have a clear-cut favorite in this category, Iron Fist Alexander of Elden Ring. A strange, large, sentient, and charming warrior jar. A jar full of the guts of the dead, with a personality as affable as you will find in the lands between, and a dude that is absolutely one of the most memorable characters in the entirety of Elden Ring, which is honestly really saying something. An NPC who yearns to be a hero of legend but seems to come up just short whenever faced with a real challenge. A vessel guy who makes a real friend in you the player as you assist him on his journey to find his place in this mess of a world. But the story and legend of this character is far more than meets the eye. A concealed hometown, a small adorable nephew, and an epic final act of his quest. Iron Fist Alexander truly carries the heart of a warrior and I want to cover it all right here, right now. What is it that makes this character so singularly special? What is his reason for fighting, his ultimate goal, and well, why is he a damn pot? Well, I just want to pause really quick to thank all of my wonderful patrons who helped me out so much by supporting this channel away from YouTube. I am Ghost, your host as always. Now please, grab your favorite nearby container, hold it close, give it a pet, and take my hand as we venture forth. So, as you likely know, Elden Ring is a massive game, an RPG that will take you like a hundred plus hours your first time through to clear, with all of these different areas, bosses, items, and surprises around every single corner. Quite simply, it's an epic experience, and this game world, The Lands Between, is a setting in a sort of beautiful cataclysmic transition when we, the player, first come along. The different storylines, the characters, gods, and forces kind of positioning for power is very much representative of the sort of instability here. And to add to that weight on your shoulders, everyone is very much wanting your personal attention as the player carves through this rotting world to eventually become the new Elden Lord and ultimately decide the fate of everything. I would even say at times it's a little too much, dude. So you know what's really nice? What's nice is that Alexander's story and presence isn't about any of that hubbub. And as funny as it sounds, this talking can actually gives you a bit of a break from like the cosmic scale narrative and brings it down to a much more digestible and human level. But hold, hold on now, boys, because I think we should just address the elephant in the room. I mean, what the hell am I looking at here? And beyond just Alexander, in Elden Ring we find an entire sub-race of beings known as, well, living jars. So I see this video additionally as a wonderful opportunity to dig into these guys a bit, try to get an idea of who and how and why they even are. So the living jars are scattered all throughout the game world and come in various different sizes, most commonly friendly and less outwardly provoked. And I remember, I'm sure you do too, when the game first launched, the jar people were a huge visual draw and talking point for fans around the world. I mean, the sheer creativity and absurdity with their appearance alone is absolutely alluring, and it only gets more fun when you meet some of these characters, especially Alexander himself, but more on that in a second. 
So Elden Ring seems to draw influence from all sorts of real world traditions and cultures, mythologies, and brands of storytelling, but especially Celtic and Norse stuff. So for me, these jars honestly have always stuck out in a pretty big way as rather different from those thematic surroundings. However, I think the more you dig into the design of Elden Ring's world and story, you see how well it pulls little ideas and concepts from so many different IRL sources, and then compiles them into one massive world that really feels culturally diverse, historically nuanced, and endlessly interesting. Now, that's all to say. The first thing that comes to mind with these jar people as far as inspiration is canopic jars of ancient Egypt. Jars that were filled with the innards of the dead in the mummification process, right? We all learned about that in school. And these were things that were for thousands of years seen as extremely important spiritual symbols of a person's passing, especially a person of some sort of influence or power, and a way for the living to do their part in ensuring safe passage to the afterlife for the departed. Now, I see that as the main possible inspiration, because here in Elden Ring, as we mentioned at the top, these living jars, including Alexander, are walking around absolutely full, filled to the brim with what else but corpses, as grim as it sounds, guts, innards, untold amounts of them, multiple deceased, mashed inside to a sort of raw meat putty that grants these guys life, and seemingly, personalities, wants and needs, wishes and dreams, all of the things that make the living, well, alive. And the personality of each pot comes from the very souls that their vessel bodies are holding. The consciousness of those dead living on in some sort of strange fragmented way in these new forms. Even being passed to the next pot when a certain living jar's time has come to an end. I mean, it's pretty damn cool. But I want to be clear that they are far from just animated ghost canisters. So take a look at the description for the companion jar talisman. Though the jars are brought to life by human flesh and blood, they are all rather kindly folk. Perhaps they were made to be better than their innards. Suggesting that they are more gentle in spirit than the humans within them once were. So it seems to me there's another layer here of being, making this strange subrace a docile, community-oriented, and largely peaceful people regardless of their contents. But that then begs the question, why do they exist at all? I mean, is this some sort of like necromancy or a natural occurrence? Were they built for a specific purpose? Well, of course, dudes, we are talking about From Software here, masters of the cryptic and interpretive lore, so I'm sorry to say, there's no answer to the questions I just asked, but there is, of course, fun little clues to concoct a guess with. So, taking a look at any of these jars, you will notice the obvious massive red seal on top, which holds a nice image of the Erd Tree. So, if you haven't played Elden Ring, the Erd Tree is this massive, beautiful, glowing, mystical tree that towers over the entire game world. It is representative of the power of the Elden Ring and the Golden Order of the Lands Between. Now, I won't get too deep into it here, but the Erd Tree is a vitally important story element of this game, as is, of course, the Elden Ring. But long before the game's events, the Elden Ring, a mysterious kind of concept itself, was shattered. It was once a collection of interlocking runes that established the law of the world, so when it was destroyed in the shattering, the Erd Tree too was changed. Then you got these little golden seeds falling from it all around the lands between, sprouting small saplings and eventually what are known as minor Erd trees. And buddy, let me tell you, all along the base of these smaller trees are countless broken, empty living jars. Hmm. And of course, each minor Erd tree is also guarded by one of these avatars armed with a big smashing hammer. So maybe these guardians act as like jar executioners, with each jar's fleshy innards nourishing the growth of those minor Erd trees. The jars being captured and brought here for this purpose, or maybe even the jars come here themselves to fulfill some sort of ultimate mission. I mean, we do see at the end of each little catacomb dungeon, minor Erd tree roots are finding their way in there, seeking the dead. And wherever there are mass amounts of buried corpses in Elden Ring, the living jars are always nearby as well. So I see there being an undeniable link here between the well-being of the trees and these people. But then the other main mystery is no one knows who made the Jar people, how they really came to be. Maybe it was Radagon, the second Elden Lord of the Lands Between, who was devout to the Golden Order and restoring the broken Elden Ring, seeking to ensure the growth and protection of those minor Erd trees. Or maybe the mages of Rhea Lucaria simply animating the pantry for one reason or another accidentally created a little community of rogue cookware. Or my favorite little theory, 
that this is simply a natural occurrence. The dead here, being at one time stored in ritual jars instead of buried, then eventually those dead began infusing the very vessels with their spirits, sprouting new people altogether that have been forced to integrate into this dangerous world and act as ferrymen of the deceased. Listen, I don't know, but I find their origins to be fascinating, man, and I'm very glad that to this point it has been left a complete and utter mystery, so please let me know what you think down below, as always. But let's be honest here, everybody. Whenever I'm thinking about these characters, you know, like Alexander and all his pot brothers, a question that crosses my mind is, do I think this guy could pilot a fighter jet? And for Alexander, I would say sadly the answer is probably no. But guess what? I can. And with the sponsor of today's video, War Thunder, you can too. Virtually, of course. War Thunder is simply put, the single most comprehensive vehicle combat video game ever made, featuring over 2,000 different tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships in massive dynamic PvP battles. With each of those vehicles being absurdly detailed down to the individual components, making playing and experiencing War Thunder extremely immersive. And dude, the collection of vehicles in War Thunder span over a hundred years of development from the 1920s all the way up to today. Add on an in-depth customization system for your vehicles with camos, historical markings, and 3D decorations. Oh baby, this game certainly packs a real punch, boys. But I gotta say, my favorite thing about War Thunder is the dynamic and detailed vehicle damage system, with realistic impacts being dealt to actual components and crew instead of just a generic health bar. So, my friends, join me in the sky, land, and sea in War Thunder. Play right now for free on PC, PlayStation, and Xbox using my Ghost Charm link in the pinned comment to claim a large bonus pack with special goodies available for only a limited time. So thank you again to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. But now that we kind of know what the jars are like and what they're about, it all brings us back to our dear sweet boy Alexander. So Alexander is a self-proclaimed warrior jar, a type of ceramic man with a very specialized and bloody existence. He is large, tenacious, courageous, and craves the blood and carnage of the battlefield. His innards are specifically made up of apparently great fighters, people who carried with them a sense of martial purpose and ability in life. So he, of course, embodies and projects those qualities as well. But you might be wondering, if the jars are meant to carry the dead to the Erd trees, I mean, why are there warriors? Again, we don't know all the concrete facts for sure, but we do get some clues to the warrior variant pots when you look at Alexander's little hometown, a small and hidden village known as Jarburg. So Jarburg is tucked away on the eastern coast of the Liurnia region, beneath the crest of a cliff. And this secretive location is no accident, dude, because it seems the living jars have sadly been a high priority target for poachers in the lands between, as their juicy innards as well as shards are imbued with rare magical properties making them super valuable. And as rambunctious as these jars can be in a fight, they ultimately are built to break, making them very easy pickings, so I think. Somewhere along the way, warrior jars were constructed to protect their kin. They were built a little thicker, a little more durable, and filled specifically with the remains of fighters. And of course, with each enemy they defeat, these warriors would be able to add their fallen opponent to their own bloody soup within, gaining strength exponentially. But when it comes to Alexander, instead of acting as a bouncer for Jarburg, he actually decided to leave his little hometown, his little cute-ass nephew Jarbaron and all Jardom behind for good. Because Alexander sees himself as not just a warrior Jar, but a warrior in the truest sense, departing on a one-way ticket to adventure, death, and glory, not necessarily in that order. This is a guy who strives to better himself, to face tough enemies and find purpose on the battlefield, fragile exterior be damned. And before we even meet him, Alexander has decided to make his way from Liurnia all the way down to Detroit. I mean Caled. His goal is to reach Redmain Castle, the home of the demigod Star Scourge Radon, where Alexander has heard of a festival of combat and war is soon to take place. And well, if he's on some sort of journey to be a warrior of legend, that sounds like a wonderful place to start. But unfortunately for Alexander, he runs into some trouble very early on in his trek, setting up your very first meeting. Hello? Hello? Oh, my stars. I'm so happy to see you. I am Alexander, also known as the Iron Fist. And as you can see, I'm stuck here. Please, can you help me out of this? Just give me a good smack from the rear with something nice and big. 
And I'll pop clean out, I'm sure. Don't dally. No, there's no need to fret. I'm very well played. Ah. Well played, good lady. Well played. Though that mighty wallop of yours almost spelt the end of me. <laughs> ah. Well, I'm out now, and that's what counts. I thank you. And man, is it just me, or do you gotta love this dude right off the bat? He's so good-natured and kind, seeing humor in a moment of vulnerability and, honestly, embarrassment. I wanna hug him, you know? I journey to the East, where I intend to further my education in the ways of the world. And beyond these lands lie the scarlet, rot-blighted Kaelid Wilds. And upon their southern edge is Redmain Castle, in which a festival of combat is being held. Now, this is no knock on any of the other awesome characters in this game, but none of them quite make a first impression like this guy, okay? Well, maybe the poo-poo eater, but that's another video altogether. He eats poo-poo! Now, really quick, I just want to highlight a huge part of this first meeting, and by extension, this specific warrior archetype in FromSoft games. So, at the top of the video, we mentioned the Onion Knights of Dark Souls, and there's a few other familiar characters like that that have fulfilled this lovable, strong, kind-hearted role. And right here, baby, we see one of the hallmark traits across all of these guys, their talent for getting themselves into pretty serious and often deadly pickles. If it's being stuck between swarms of enemies and needing a hand, getting swindled by patches and ending up naked in a well, or here just literally being stuck in the ground. And I think it is a humorous, but also very appropriate trait to give an NPC like this, as it allows us, the players, to actually kind of cultivate a friendship over time in a really believable manner. It also justifies the help that they offer us in return. There's no serious expectations, tasks, or items you need to gain for these characters or anything. It's just a mutual relationship of jolly cooperation in a dangerous land. That's Solaire approved, baby. But it actually goes even a little bit further other than that, as Alexander in the very game files of Elden Ring is nicknamed Potmire, a shout out to the onions who came before, and I find that to be adorable and very, very cool. So after this first brush with Alexander, he can next be found again in Limgrave, not far off in the Gale Tunnel. It seems he's still on his way down to Kaelid, but soon after he was stuck in the ground, now finds himself with another issue, a dead end. Oh, the esteemed warrior. Where did you spring from? This was supposed to be a dead end, I'm sure of it. What's going on here? A door from thin air. Well, stranger things happen at sea, or so I'm told. But onward to the Kaelid Wilds. Gosh, that dead end had me rather stumped. <laughs> to the festival at Redmain Castle on the southern edge of the scarlet rot blighted Kaelid Wilds. Doesn't the thought just set your heart aflutter? Now, if you're anything like me, you don't see Alexander for a while after this, because I swear to God, I tried to avoid Kaelid as long as possible because of the Scarlet Rot and the big doggies. Terrible place, man. But once you finally get up the nerve to conquer this big toilet of a zone and carve a path down to Redmain, amongst other great warriors in this legendary atmosphere, we find our flag and friend preparing himself for what's about to happen. Ah, you came. How delightful. Indeed, I thought I might find you here. By the by, do you know for whom this festival is being held? Well, it is none other than General Radan himself. To think, I could face a great champion of the Shattering, a demigod in the flesh. Oh, God, in truth, I quiver at the thought. Such is his frightful repute. But... The fear simply assures me the ordeal is worth undertaking. Be sure to get a good vantage, my friend. I, Iron Fist Alexander, do hereby vow to unflinchingly brave this ordeal. Now, it's important to note how significant General Radon is in the lore of the world here in Elden Ring. A demigod, a hero, perhaps the greatest warrior currently living in the lands between. It is very likely that this is Alexander's idol, and him making it all the way down here from Liurnia, that's a really big deal, man. And when you finally start said festival and challenge Radon yourself, Alexander is one of the many summon signs you can select to join you in the fray. And for the most cinematic experience, I definitely suggest you summon them all. Shit is amazing. 
But once Radon finally falls at your hand, we can see that the Iron Fist didn't fare too well in combat. Ah, oh, hello there. Um, it was a battle marvelously fought. You are well and truly a champion, friend. I, on the other hand, am nothing but a croc. One hit was all it took to crack me, and for my insides to come spilling out. After that, I... I hid like a coward, and as such, I can hardly stand to face one such as you. <sighs> but don't you think I've given up just yet? As luck would have it, there's a veritable mountain of warriors' bodies right here. If I can just squeeze this bunch down inside me, I'll be a mighty warrior again in no time. And you know, the bodies found here are exceedingly fine. Who could expect any less from the very warriors who fought in the Shattering? The greatest of all wars. <laughs> Just you wait and see, friend. I'll grow even stronger. Just you wait when next we meet. <laughs> And damn, I just love this image, dude, picking through the ancient remains of the Shattering, a war that happened a very, very long time ago, to try to find dregs of great warriors of old and fill himself with them. He even grabs a chunk of Radon and adds it to the mix, but it's notably quite a shift here, to say the least. I mean, this is the first time Alexander's spirit really seems broken. And I think in his eyes right now, he's failing. His body is cracked and his prospects of becoming this legendary warrior are looking pretty grim, especially in comparison to you. And I think that is a really big key here. So it makes a lot of sense that the next place you encounter him is right near his hometown of Jarburg way back in Liurnia, stuck yet again in a damn hole. Hello? Hello? Anyone? My thanks in advance. I know you're the woman for the job. You know what to do, hmm? Give me a good smack from behind, with something nice and big. No, no, don't worry about my wound, sustained at the festival. I'm stuck back together good and proper. <laughs> Just give it your all. <laughs> I thought I was apt to split in half. I can feel my lower half is stuck on something. I don't think you can get me out just by hitting me this time. Perhaps there's a way to slide me out a little more smoothly. Oh, dearie me. I'm oilier than a toad. <laughs> yeah, there were countless oil jars back where I'm from, actually. And now I know what it's like to be one of them. <laughs> yes. Indeed, I too have a home, though it is one to which I have vowed not to return. So, I thought I might look out from atop the cliff, but as I drew closer and closer, pow, wouldn't you know it, I was perfectly stuck in that blasted hole. I can feel the warriors inside admonishing me for my mawkishness. To walk the path of champions, one cannot cleave to the past. I'm headed to the Fiery Mount in the north. I can strengthen myself there without fear of cracking this vessel. I will forge myself anew in its flames. So a little oil and a good smack later, out he pops again. And he's definitely looking a bit ragged, isn't he? Maybe he wanted to make sure his little nephew was safe, and we will get to him later. But it's kind of sweet sentiment to me that he comes back around these parts. I mean, his quest begins with shedding the safety of Jarburg to do great and dangerous things, but after all he has already seen and been through, I'm sure just being nearby soothes him in some way. And I think it's worth noting that although we see Alexander obviously start to struggle and have his confidence shaken a bit, he is far, far from inept. I mean, the various areas he is able to reach alone in the state the lands between are in is an extremely impressive feat. Bro is on a certified gamer adventure, fighting through extremely dubious zones with fearsome enemies, just like we are. And I think this is another thing mirrored with the Onion Knights of the past games. Extremely capable and brave, but at a certain point, they just hit a wall or two. So be sure you don't write off Alex here as some scrub because this dude is a G. And next up, yes, we find the Iron Fist bathing in the comforting molten flow of Mount Gale. Oh, Bake me in your flames. Oh. Oh. Mm. Ah, good 
lady. What business might you have in such a place as this? I hardly think you're here to temper yourself with flame, considering that fleshly form of yours. Your timing, though, is impeccable as ever. I've been making just the thing for you on my journey here. Take it. I'm sure it'll suit you to the team. But, uh, it's hardly more than lukewarm here. I won't be able to temper my body such that it'll never crack again. Perhaps I'll head eastward. There's an old saying I've caught wind of. Above the lofty clouds, the icy giant's peak doth soar. Here lieth the flame of ruin, which ever burning roars. So the saying he mentions is alluding to the fact that he intends to head to the snowy mountaintops of the giants, the one-time home of the legendary fire giants who had their flame of ruin encased in the giant forge. It's a whole other ancient storyline of course, but I think Alexander intends to place himself within this flame hot enough to weld his cracks closed. And although we don't find the Iron Fist when we traverse this region, he can be summoned for the boss fight against the Fire Giant, which, as always, helps give the encounter a much more epic scale in my opinion. Also, shout out to the boy for personally crafting this jar helmet for you. My god, is it glorious. So after making your way through the mountaintops of the Giants, you find yourself next in the cinematic and stunning Crumbling Ferrum Azula the ancient capital city of the dragons, which is now in ruins, guarded by beastmen and other wild creatures. I mean, what an epic backdrop, boys, because this, this is actually the last place we encounter Iron Fist Alexander. His long, perilous quest to forge himself into a stronger warrior concludes here in the realm of ancient dragons. But this is where his true warrior heart reveals itself, because over the course of this entire wholesome friendship, we have proven to him that we are everything he wishes to be, felling gods and legends alike with relative ease, and well, as we know, for this warrior jar there is indeed one surefire way to become that strong. Ah, I see you finally made it here yourself. The city hanging in the air is slowly crumbling. What an incredible place we find ourselves. But that aside, you're suddenly a force to be reckoned with, eh? I doubt there's a single soul who could have handled that giant other than you. It was practically a god. Of course, I count myself the great Alexander among the many. Which means I've but one thing to ask of you. Would you kindly undertake my ordeal? Come and tell me when you're ready. I've been longing to fight a warrior as accomplished as you. You are ready then, I take it. Then let us begin. I am the great Jar Warrior, Iron Fist Alexander. Lend me strength, O oh warriors. Let us become one champion. I knew you were the stuff of champions. It was a marvelous battle. I implore you, take what I bequeath from inside me. All vessels are destined to one day break. But the great Alexander lived as a warrior to his last. <laughs> Across all of human history, there have been various legends and stories that talk of the warrior's death. The idea that a person who has given their life to the art of war must meet their end in an honorable fashion on the battlefield. The Vikings believed it was the only way for a warrior to make it to Valhalla. The Romans and samurai would sooner fall on their own sword than succumb to disease or being captured. And perhaps the most cinematic trope in all of fiction adjacent to this very idea is the duel to the death, an affair of honor between two individuals that don't even necessarily have any grudge or anger toward one another. 
but one or both of them is seeking to test themselves or die in the process. Now, if you ask me, Alexander knew with certainty he stood no chance against you. His bravado and confidence are not convincing, considering his broken body and various pickles we have seen him in. But even in death, his attitude and outlook is so positive and matter-of-fact, leaving us with a shard of his body which greatly boosts your damage output, as well as his very innards, the guts of the warriors that came before which made up his spirit, heart, and personality. Now I'ma be honest, this is a rather somber quest, all things considered, but it absolutely seems that Alexander lived it to the fullest and was honored to fall at your hand. But this is not the end. So reading the description of those innards confirms that these are passed from jar to jar, meaning that perhaps before Alexander, a very similarly cheery warrior pot existed, and now it's time for these innards to be brought to the next in line. Now we mentioned earlier how Alexander's story also involves that of his tiny Jar nephew, Jar Bear. But another character that we've yet to bring up, and another one of my favorites, is a human knight named Dialos of House Hoslo, and he has a small adjacent role here in relation to Alexander as well. So Jar Baron is quite obviously a youthful vessel, but claims that he too is constructed to be a warrior Jar. Hey, cuz, have you met Uncle Alexander? He used to live here with us, but then he left to be a champion. I asked to go with him, but he said, the path of champions must be trod alone. So heroic, right? I'm actually a warrior jar as well. One day, I'll be just like Uncle Alexander, and I'll have to leave the village to become a champion. So understandably, he thinks Uncle Alexander is about the coolest damn jug in the lands between and eagerly awaits his return and guidance. But when you meet this little runt in Jarburg, he's actually searching for a potentate, or a ruler, a monarch, and protector. Because as we stated before, these jars are often poached for their innards and prefer to have a kind-hearted human present to lead and protect them. Now, he says you would be great, but your hands are a little too rough. Okay then, dude. So he has his own little quest line regarding this and eventually meets that knight, Dialos. My friend, it's been far too long. I have to say you caught me at a rather low point, but as you see, I've put all that behind me. Left the volcano manor, forging my own path now, making my own choices. Even a fool like me can look after some simple jars. Truly an incredible character, worthy of a video to himself. And if you're progressing all these quests kind of in tandem, right around the time Alexander challenges you and falls in combat, far from home in Faramazula, Jarburg is indeed attacked by poachers. Dialos fights bravely but dies defending the place, saving Jar Baron specifically as other jars were being smashed. And after the conflict, we see Jar Baron so moved and inspired by the bravery and tenacity of Dialos, he begins to dismantle the fallen warrior's corpse and fill his vessel. And then you can inform Jar Baron of the passing of his great uncle and offer up his insides to the young warrior Jar. I'm about to go on a journey as a warrior Jar in search of glory. Wow. Cuz, are these insights from Uncle Alexander? <sighs> Thank you, cuz. I'm a warrior jar, so I need to be strong. I can really have them, right? I understand. I'll get strong, strong enough. I deserve to have uncle's insights. I don't think I'll see you again. When I set out, warriors are supposed to work alone. Goodbye, cuz. And thanks for everything. I'll never forget you, cuz. I think overall, there is so much that sets Alexander and the entire Jarburg questline apart from the other similar characters of the past games. Now, I'm not sure if you personally pick up on this or it's just me overthinking and overanalyzing, which hey, I tend to do, baby. But Alexander carries a much more, I guess, morally neutral energy throughout the lands between than, say, the Onion Knights. And at times, Alexander even comes off as a little bit bloodthirsty or single-minded, because remember, he is a warrior, not a hero, a fighter, not a knight. There's even a part of me that wonders about his overall intentions regarding the player character. He befriends us, yes, but in a way that is always beneficial to him. 
He relies on us to get him through the world and out of really dangerous situations. And obviously by the quest's end, he would love nothing more than to smash you into a pulp and consume your corpse to gain your strength. But I don't know. I want to believe he really was your friend. A friend that was bound to his nature. Now, I understand that my subscriber base has been asking for Elden Ring content for like over a year and this isn't necessarily the character you all wanted first. Iron Fist Alexander isn't the largest scale NPC in this game, not even close, but he is certainly one of the most lovable and fascinating to me. Iron Fist Alexander ultimately in many ways failed when it comes to his lofty goals, cracking under pressure and bursting when bested by a superior foe. But he did go on an inspiring quest. He saw the world and improved himself along the way, adding legendary remains to his innards and leaving the next warrior jar stronger than he was. So no matter what you think of Iron Fist Alexander, none can doubt the courage, the charisma, the heart, and the spirit of a warrior. It just seems all vessels are destined to one day break. Thank you guys so much for watching and listening to the end. Honestly, I love this character, small as the video and concept might be when compared to my last upload. Also, check out this adorable little note my girlfriend left on my Google Doc of this script. I love her, man. She's awesome. Thank you again to my patrons, and make sure that you all check out the Ghost Charm link in the description as well as pinned comment to play War Thunder for free today. Thank you War Thunder again for sponsoring this video. Let me know other NPCs you guys would like to see covered, and I will see you all very very soon. Until next time, peace.